I guess you have to Who do cares? That again. Do what again? You gotta do the intro again. Oh, okay. Well, do I have to? I already did it. Well, it's not recorded, so it's like you didn't do the intro. Adam, you effed it up, so you just gotta have to redo it again. Kelly says hi. All right, here you go. Hi, Kelly. Did you just say I effed it up? Uh, yes. <laughs> are we are we gonna go there right now? Do it. Do the intro. Come on. Ladies and gentlemen, the rudest co-host of all time. We are in Get Realism's podcast, episode twenty-three. I am Adam Chase Rennie, and I am Christine Chen. There she is, you guys. With a forced restart, it is a okay. This is the Get Realism's podcast. Yeah. This is great. So what do we talk about? Thanks, Christine, for podcast. for <laughs> doing this. Calling you out. <laughs> you calling me out? Uh oh. Uh oh. We're gonna go down a dangerous road here, Christine. I don't know if you want to go down this path. <laughs> because of the tip top before we even started recording, mm -hmm. she called me a whole bunch of profanities. I so I will readily admit my mouth can be quite profane. Shame, shame. <laughs> shame. But you know what? Shame. The greatest part about it, though, is that our very rude co-host, Christine Chen, is now part of the uh, Directors Guild of uh, Assistant DGA. Directors, yes. right? Yes, I am in the DGA. Well, Congratulations, Christine. Okay, I can't celebrate yet because technically I have to pay a very big fee before I can be officially in it. Oh. So this just qualifies me for it. Like, you can't even get on the list to be in the DGA without qualifying for it, you know? Mm. So you have to have 130 days of qualified film work as an AD to be right. able to be in the DGA. And it's like getting into the finals club or something. Like, they don't even tell you really what qualifies and what doesn't qualify. It's very, very, very big. It's like, but I thought you hey, said there was like a whole checklist, right? Like, didn't you tell me? Checklist. There okay. is a checklist, but it's not clear either. So it'll be like, hey, you can get in if you do mostly feature and television work and some shorts. But what does that mean? Like, why uh, do you yeah, that doesn't mean qualify, right? Yeah. So then, so then that's that. And then it's like, hey, provide all this, this documentation. Cool. You need to provide uh, call sheets, you got to provide production reports. Um, you got to provide your pay stub and you got to provide your contract, your deal memo, a crew list. It's crazy what you need to provide. So, but even then it's not very clear. So apparently for anybody out there who wants to be in the DGA or qualify, a pay stub. Well, probably any union for that matter. If somebody pays you via Venmo. Like, I wish they'd tell you that. They don't. Yeah. Really? Yeah, it doesn't count if it's paid through Venmo. So I wish I'd known that starting off, I would have like forced production to like write me a check or something. So these are little things that I learned after. Even though it's a, uh, okay, wow. Yeah, they purposely like don't tell you this stuff. And then you go in and you're like, all right, cool, let me submit my application. And then half your stuff doesn't go through because they're like, um, this one is through Venmo. And then this one is a short that hasn't screened on, you know, in a film festival. So it's not even in the film festival and like a bunch of other stuff, but I get it. It's, it's a, it's a very prestigious, you know, they want They weren't going to let anybody in, you know, it's, it's, they want some sort of caliber. If everybody could get in, then it's not really that special. So, um, I get it. It's fine. But I made it somehow. Yay. You That's did. Hard. You yes. did. And then you just have so to, you just yeah, have so, to pay the fuckers. <laughs> yes, exactly. So what happens is now when I get accepted onto a union job, then, and I would start paying dues, and then I am then officially in the DGA. So right now I'm on this wait list, basically. Like I'm in it, I'm qualified for it. Someone just needs to give me a DGA project. Someone, someone out there. <laughs> Someone out there who can give me a union project. So then after the union project, because that's I'm when available. So, so but not available from October 19th until November. I won't be available for a month. 
Well, so, you're here to hear, folks. Yeah. But um, then afterwards, I will be available. Except in December. Just kidding. Well, not really, but yes. I will be available next year. <laughs> Well, you heard it here, folks. She's just as useful as Banksy. She escapes <laughs> every single schedule and also the common people. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus but, Christ. Uh, yeah, I just had a, uh, today I had a really great conversation about uh, the film prize. And so, as you know, uh, we are coming up to the weekend and Sunday is the last time people can watch the film prize films and they should watch them because there are some fantastic films are there I watched all of the films i will not talk about them because that would not be cool and not fair but i can just say that there are like always some incredible work and it's always extremely inspiring to watch other filmmakers because that's how we learn and grow and i think that's the best part about the film prize more so than any other film festival because you it's just 20 people every year right so 20 people is a lot easier to follow than like 150 people in a film festival which are not consistent ever and not every film festival is ever consistent but but like at least it's 20 people and for the most part a few of these really good people continue to reappear and it's fun because then it's like this really cool family reunion and we all challenge each other to be better filmmakers. And I think that's what makes Film Price so unique is, is that experience. And Film Price does such a great job, like really providing resources for their filmmakers. So like this whole week, we had so many panels, like one-on-one -on -one judging, like judges mentorship. It's funny because my lead actor is like complaining. He's like, how many panels do we have? I'm like, dude. What? Like, you complaining? That's, that's <laughs> complaining. That is amazing on. that they did this. It's work. great. Yes, it is hard to like be. I think it's more just like we're. It's hard to be available for all of them. But um, well, because you have to be on twenty four seven, you know, right, right. and that sucks. Yeah, right. but so at the same time, like you're doing twenty questions. more. Right, yeah. you're doing twenty more panels than probably most people who would get in those. <laughs> right, and get I in those things. Like, okay. And, Although I got to say, I totally, right, yeah. sadly, um, rolled out of bed it, just in time for one of my panels. So that hopefully uh, it didn't feel that way or translate in that way. And I sounded maybe semi-intelligent, I hope. <laughs> yeah, no, you sound intelligent. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what you could have said that, that you could have mm -hmm. fucked that up. <laughs> Maybe calling this someone like, a bitch on a podcast. This is Who bad knows? When the lead actor calls you and is like, "Aren't you supposed to be on the pod? Aren't you supposed to be on the panel?" And I'm like, "Oh crap!" <laughs> oh really? It was like yeah. that. Whoa! Well, he, he he called me and then I was like, "Oh crap!" And then called him back. He was like, "Hey, I just was calling to check and see if we're going to be on the panel." I was like, "Yeah, I am." He's like, "Good," because I can't talk to you because I'm literally on the panel right now. I'm like, "Oh." <laughs> Right. <coughs> Hilarious. So. That's, that's fun. Mm -hmm. So um, are you doing just press for Film Prize right now? and then? Yeah, um, showing face at these um, Zooms. I did my filmmaker interview yesterday and uh, kind of talked about the experience. It was really neat to hear other people's experiences. I think what's been really interesting with the films is you can tell that the shooting style and stories have definitely been affected in by COVID restrictions. So this year it's more dialogue driven pieces, um, simpler stories, less conversation, uh, less, you know, locations and stuff like that. And, um, it's been very interesting. It's been cool to see how people have taken that limitation and like run with it, you know? Um, yeah. I think, that's where real art comes from is through what you can do with what you got and the limitations that are around you. I think, I think that's why some of the best films are these like ultra low budget things because they didn't have money to throw at their problems and they had to think creatively to fix them in a very unique way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I have a, and for, Oh, LaCroix, such a filmmaker. <laughs> Yeah, Are dude. Shout out to uh, Lemon Limoncello Lacroix. Oh, yeah. About like yeah. seven of them at Is the. Are you sipping Lacroix so that it feels like you're still on film set? 
<laughs> no, because it is it is a California treat, lady. Okay, oh. it is it is it is what I rock. Lately, though, I've been drinking Topo Chico, so I'm oh, I'm slowly Chico. slowly morphing into the the Texas lifestyle. Yeah, but like to- nothing's going to keep me away from my Lacroix. Lacroix. Yeah. So mm. yeah. So this week has just been um, waiting, for this week, having in depth conversations with random friends about how we think about the films and stuff. And uh, yeah, I had a very long conversation between from all 20 of the films about how, um, why we like or didn't like certain films. And um, it's neat because though as humans, we can pick up on very similar things. Like we can tell that's a good story or that's good cinematography or like, I like that. We're all still, we all react to things very differently. And so there's stuff where I was like, really? You like that film? I really did not like that film. So it's like, so yeah. it's, that's why film price is so exciting because you really, it can, the grand price can go any way, you know? You really yeah. can. Sometimes it's an audience vote. Maybe the audience really resonates with something. Sometimes it's a, it's a judge's vote. You know, you just, you just never know. You just never know. Yeah, that's why I can't always agree with somebody else if they, like, I can't get into an argument on how somebody takes away a certain movie. Because you can't, you can't really explain that to somebody. You can't be like, well, this is how I feel about the film, so thus, that's what the film's about. No. Everybody takes away something from a piece of movie just because you got a different message than the other guy. Yeah. Doesn't necessarily mean you enjoy the same exact movie. Even though you watch the same movie. Totally. You, you didn't have a completely different experience. Like yeah. on one of the conversation we had was there was a film that I, I quite liked, but the other person couldn't get behind it because it clashed too much with his beliefs. And he felt bad for it. And I said, No, that's that that don't be because that's how we are. Our our experiences are gonna cloud our judgment. And maybe what should be instead is that that film didn't have a, didn't tell the story in a compelling way that enabled you to connect with it emotionally in a way for you to deter from your strong held beliefs. Yes. Does that make sense? 100%. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So maybe that's more the issue, you know, because I feel, I mean, with the exception of it, even like really crappy things like KKK and all that stuff. Like, right. I feel like somebody with immense skill for storytelling could tell it in a way that would make you think, question things, you know? So question what like question like, like my belief like you're like I, I I ultimately will will say you know I, I cannot stand you know hate organizations but I'm sure there's right. a way to spin another perspective of that like if the story was about like this boy who grew up around that and was a product of their environment you know and then because oh, of I that see. like that's all they believed in for example like that I could get behind that. And be able to be like, okay, I see, but then I that, understand, but be emotionally. But you're saying like the character already started off in that toxic environment. However, sure, that, that, that's just an example. That's a little example of like, right. if you're a good storyteller, I feel like, or the story is told well, any controversial story to your beliefs, you should be able to justify it. it and say, hey, that was a good film. You know, and justify that was, it. Yeah, that was the conversation we were having. Is that he didn't feel that? You know, like I see. It, okay, it was, the story was not strong enough that his point of view significantly clouded the quality of the story. Like he couldn't look past it. But so he was feeling bad for feeling that way. But I told him that that's not on him as an audience. That some of that is. <laughs> Hi, Thomas. Um, that some of it was because uh, the storyteller didn't do a good job 
connecting from an emotional aspect to be able to sway somebody or at least have somebody question their, you know, deep founded beliefs. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and also like you have to, everything needs to have like an open dialogue, right? Like everything has to be subjected. I don't want to say, because argument sounds like there's going to be hostility, just having a conversation. Yeah. I guess then the question would be, what do you think makes a film worthy of conversation without having to, what, what, what does right. it mean when you get preached to in a film? Because that's a common, that is a definitely a common note in writing being too on the nose or too preachy. And that's, I feel like is a very common mistake to make as a writer, filmmaker. Oh, you I know, think. that reminds me what you're, what you're talking about, like, especially cultural appropriation and, um, just understanding understanding each other and understanding the bigger picture of humanity. Have you ever seen the movie um, Do the Right Thing from Spike Lee? I have not. Is that good? <sighs> it's a classic. I know. I'm. It's a classic. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not a judgment against you. No, it's, uh, in fact, I'm jealous because I would love to see that movie all over again because it feels like everyone needs to watch that movie, especially nowadays. Because it, it's about it's about poking at those stereotypes yeah. and either weaponizing it, yeah, or um, <clears throat> like, yeah, or, or I guess the opposite, like victimizing, like victimizing sure. somebody else or preaching to oneself for for the community, like as if somebody like died and made you king of that race yeah. you know what i mean like some it just doesn't make sense but it touches on all these aspects especially racism like racism is the ever like that's like the the biggest picture uh and that's a trademark for spike lee in general but mm-hmm. um that movie in particular um really really pokes at the idea of what literally what you're talking about in in preaching Right. Preaching, but like seeing the entire picture instead of just seeing like, like through a microscope on one thing, actually Mm -hmm. like develop an an opinion and a perspective of other people, you know, because you can affect a lot of people with what you say and what you do. Sure. You know, that's why, that's why there's, there's a world with, with winners and a world with losers, you know, and we live and thrive in that, in this same world, we just have to help one another and always just know to do the right thing. Like that's the, mm-hmm. that's the point of the movie. Right. Um, yeah, dude, I, I agree. There's gotta be more of that though. There's gotta be, and also there's gotta be more narratives that poke, I want to say poke fun, but sort of like demystify taboos, you know, like D like, I don't know, like poke fun at, at a stereotype within a respectful, like in a respectful manner, sure. you know, and to do that is really hard, especially nowadays with comedy and stand up comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard because now everything is set for accountability. So, you know, whatever you say goes and you're being held against your word, even though a comedian doesn't believe in a single word they say sometimes because it's a joke, a joke's a joke, still it hurts someone else's feelings. Not saying that one side's better or the other, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing to think about, you know? Yeah. Because that's also the argument for Quentin Tarantino. Sure, sure. Tarantino has been the most controversial filmmaker I think in my lifetime next to maybe before that Martin Scorsese, maybe, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe, I don't know, but, or Stanley Kubrick. Um, I just saw a bunch of comments on um, Paul just said that American history X, Malcolm X, these are examples of where, Right. Didn't quite believe in or couldn't quite connect to the subject, but really related to the character, and because of that, was able to give it the time and look past whatever beliefs 
he had and not have that cloud his enjoyment of the film. That's but a good example. Yeah. Those are yeah. Great examples. yeah. That's a very good example. Yeah. So, yeah, I yeah, agree. Yeah, but that's what it is. I think that I think it's in the I don't think we're responsible for for anything we're filmmakers we do whatever we want. But but yeah. But can we go? I mean, there's there's filmmakers who dare I say make real controversial films and sure. some of that just never sees the light of day sure i'm not saying i'm not saying one art is better than the other no not not at all i think and you shouldn't put a muzzle on art personal perspective you know i had i actually had this conversation um somebody asked the question of like hey what are your thoughts on history and changing things Mm. and personally i don't feel right to change anything when it comes to history I i want to be as factual as possible and not base my story on how i believe if i can i feel like as i'm responsible uh, that's just me though i i i think maybe it's because i came from a documentary background and realism is a big deal but i just know the danger of doing that you know it's and i can give you the perfect example um i'm a producer on a on a documentary right now and ooh, some of the research that we've gotten have been like old newspaper articles or old an old book that was written and in this um context we're finding we're learning about this particular it's it's about the uh, shreveport little theater here but we're we're finding we're digging and finding that some of the things that were said very pc were not exactly how it happened but oh we wouldn't have known that because it's written a certain way for you to feel and believe a certain thing happened right it's oh, so it's interpreted differently oh yeah and it's only wow. because we are digging right now that we're realizing this and it's crazy so it, uh i mean it's not like so an example was there was these two uh, directors of the shreveport little theater and in the book it kind of glosses over and says that oh these directors like retired right and when we're doing this interview and the dude's like, no, 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 no. They got fired. <laughs> wow. Like, oh, shit. They got fired because they were kind of narrow-minded and a little bit racist. Yeah. Essentially, is what wow. short was said, but a lot more PC, of course. And, like, I never, nobody would ever know that, ever, if they based history only off of what is in existence. Right. Right. And, and that's just, cr- that's so crazy to me. And it just makes me wonder how many things that we've learned that are like that. I mean, th- it is already popping up, you know, like nobody learned about black wall street, you know, nobody's worked. Nobody. About, yeah. A lot of, a lot of different things. And, and, and it makes you really question like what you're learning in school and, and um, education and, and why not. But it's just like, if I can not do that, I'm going to try not to. Like I, I, I don't like skewing things that way. I would rather present both sides of something and be okay that I may not believe in something, but I'm yeah. not going to just skew a, a film to get my point across but that's hard you know what i'm saying this yet i'm sure people will still interpret films a certain way so like i'm sure if they were to read my script for in root you know they would be like oh you're about gun control and like you're clearly trying to make me believe that we shouldn't have guns you know and that's 100 percent not what i got from the script but oh, good. good i mean you like you forced it. me to read it. <laughs> it's in Shreveport. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, you didn't. We were in Shreveport, and uh, and I read it. Yeah. And and I loved the oh, script. Wait, you and read I, the short though. Did you read the feature? No, I didn't. Okay. I need to send you the feature and see. What yeah. You know. yeah. But I mean, I don't know. But I know you though. You know what I mean? Like I don't. I don't necessarily see or hear or understand. Like, oh yeah, I could see that. Like, on route can be about gun control. It's like, well. I feel like people can, but you're right though. 
everybody takes their own interpretation of the film. Exactly. Of anything. The, the problem is most people won't have the the opportunity to get to know me. So they're, they're just going to base. But I mean, for the people who think that, that it's about gun control, I mean, can I, can I be frank with you, Christine? Sure. And say, go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, okay. by the way. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm saying that for those people. I'm saying it for those people who would criticize something that is way from left field. That's like, that's like if I said, uh, I said, um, oh, Inception is about uh, ecstasy because you're being injected with some sort of sedative and you're going into layers of, of fucking shit. I can argue that it's about LSD. Inception is 100% about LSD. I what? can make that argument. I can yeah, make I that totally. argument. Sure, 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 sure. Just as much as somebody can make on route an argument that's about gun control. You see what I'm saying, Christine? Yeah. But so go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, though, but that is the beauty of art. It's the- it is. And that's why. That, but I, I can have the ability to say, go fuck yourself, too, sure, and say, that, you know, whatever. But I also respect other people's opinions, too. Sure. Like, if somebody, if somebody, you know, unless it's not true. If it's not true, then it's hurtful. And it's like, what? It's, are you sure. kidding me? You know? But I've always wondered but, uh, about that. It's like, you know, you're in language arts or English or whatever, and we're, like, looking into all the symbolism in, in a book. And I've always wondered, like, how many, what if the dude just really just wanted the colors to be black? Like, and it didn't mean Yes, 100%. Right? And <laughs> it was, was just like, oh. I, like, I don't know. Because I can, like, make up. I was really good at being like, and this, and this really symbolizes this. I, I, I knew exactly what English teachers wanted to hear and stuff like that. And I could make all these sorts of connections to things and stuff like that. And I'm like, do you know I'm pulling most of this stuff out of my butt? Like. How, how right. would you say that they didn't just write this because they wanted to write a cool story about how somebody's riding a boat down the river? Right. It didn't mean anything, you know? You just put uh-huh. things. So, yeah. yeah. But to be fair, in route has a lot of symbolism in it. Um, I would be yeah. doing what people thought, which is like when people were watching Vue. Um, my uh, VFX dude, David, who I love very dearly, shout out this whole backstory to the story that I was like, "Whoa, you must be on drugs." <laughs> but it was utterly fascinating to hear somebody else's interpretation of a film that you know very well how you were trying to 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 say, you know. Um, I had people, there, yeah. Yeah. I love I love that boundless imagination though. You know? Yeah. Even if it does feel like, wow, this guy must be on all of the drugs on everything, <laughs> it's still you you can still get an amazing good story. It, it, are you in awe and fascination of what I just said, Christine? Or is that a face no, of I'm you're, reading these you're not listening to me? Very funny. Paul said I should be a rapper and I wonder why I would like him to elaborate on this on this is it because i talk really fast um the second one is quite nice chelsea said art will always be controversial because everyone sees what they want to see primarily based on their own a hundred percent beautiful beautiful a hundred percent that is a hundred percent chelsea what alfred what it is good job yes yes exactly yes um paul can you please elaborate why you think i should be a rapper because <laughs> i don't think i should be a rapper i actually am terrible at rapping because you're good at wordplay. Oh, well, thank you. I didn't even know I was doing that. <laughs> um, that yeah, that was that was great with Chelsea being um, cut. Yeah, yeah, and that is that's the beauty of art. You know, it's it, it is that it's that it's it's based off your interpretation. You don't know what's influencing that. You know. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm being trolled by two of my friends. <laughs> what do you mean? What are you talking about? There's a Thomas says that, bro, me too, Paul, been saying that. Basically, he's agreeing that I should be here. <laughs> it's fine. I just have some weirdo friends. <laughs> 
Well, shout out to them. Yeah, shout out to Thomas is the lead actor from Away, by the way. It was quite good. Yes. Uh, Friend of the yeah. podcast. Yes, he was on the podcast earlier. You didn't know that, Paul, but uh, Thomas has a podcast with Get Realism. You should look in the old stuff and look for it. He actually said some semi-intelligent things. Um, I was quite surprised, actually. <laughs> That's r- incredibly rude, but we're gonna we're gonna move past it. We're gonna move past it. Um, this is how we treat our hosts, our our, our guests. <laughs> not me, but Christine Chen. Absolutely, <laughs> I call it out as it is, as it should be. You can call it the Christine Chen guarantee. <laughs> Asshole, or your money back. <laughs> no, but I wanted to talk about um, being controversial, especially in filmmaking, because. Yeah. I feel like here's what I love. I love the feeling of it's going to sound so weird, but I love, so this is the best feeling that I've ever had. And it was one time when I saw stand up comedy and it was, uh, it was Joe Coy. I saw him when I was 18 years old and he was in San Francisco laugh factory. Okay. Yeah, he was in, when I was in California, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've been Uh, in a factory. I love stand-up comedy. I find it to be utterly raw, and, I mean, I get some of the stuff that they're saying can be controversial, but, like, sometimes some of the stuff that they're saying needs to be said. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, like, well, so this, so how this happened was Joe Coy was just did a surprise spot and okay. I was, we were just wa- and he did this surprise spot and, uh, he went on for like an hour and there was this guy who just heckled him, who just straight up heckled him and Joe Coy lit this guy up so hard like made fun of how short he was he was bald he was this he was that he just lit him up and then at the end he was like i have the stage this is the stage time the spotlight's on me the mic is on me this is what i'm doing now so respect it or go yeah and that's what he said bye and uh they left they because he wanted he wanted the next guy or something. He was like, I paid to see so and so and he was like, Go fuck yourself. Like yeah. I'm here. Like if you don't like it, then you can you can go. Granted, I understand you're you're paying money, but that's also the point of a comedy show. You know, because people people always do that. In films I feel like are no exception. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like film should provoke that some sort of controversy mm-hmm. yet but provoke the controversy and validate that sure. not just do it just for the sake of the joke not don't sure. don't just be racist for the for the funny of being racist you know what i mean like be racist but have an understanding where that's going to go to yeah instead yeah. of just instead of just interjecting something that's completely fucking stupid you know like if this is like um like a jamie kennedy movie or like a marlon wayans film you know like one of those spoof movies like that's not i mean nothing against those movies i i I do enjoy those movies but that those have no context for anything you just have to whatever they're going to do if they're going to be racist they're going to be racist if they're going to be homophobic they're going to be homophobic whatever it is it is what it is you take it or leave it but I do like and appreciate that kind of art that will have this overreaching arc where it makes anything, any uncomfortable situation have some sort of elaborate, like get out. Yeah. Like having, I think that's, I think that's the power of art is, yeah, that's why I love filmmaking. Um, I, I know I in my, in my interviews that it's the one place that I don't feel like I have to compromise how I believe in, and I can truly say what I feel. Um, yeah. If it, it, it's very important to me because I've grown up always feeling like I had to compromise what I actually felt. Um, and it, it's fine. It's just culture, you know, um, in a traditional um, Asian culture, it's very much about the greater good of the community. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
Um, in fact, I would say that the American culture can be very too selfish sometimes, and they, they can learn from that. <laughs> yeah, I um, couldn't but, agree more. Yeah, but I, I think that because of that, I'm so drawn to filmmaking because I can just say what I want, you know, what I feel. And um, I think as long as I can look at it from multiple perspectives and respect different views and respect that's where you have your protagonist, your antagonist, and, and your bad guys and stuff. You have to be able to, as a writer, treat them equally, right? You have to 100%. understand why someone could go murder somebody. You don't agree with that, but without that perspective, how are you going to write a good character, right? Um, how are you going to write a good story without perspective? How are you write that? Yes, exactly. And so that's, I think that's the beauty of, of art is being able to explore that. Um, Paul says, there is a power in allowing others to see you through a different perspective. Oh, that's beautiful, too. That's Paul, right. you are so smart. That's right. Shout out. I'm so glad I met you. <laughs> yes. How does Thomas have such smart friends? I don't understand. <laughs> Possibly he's a smart guy himself, but that's neither here nor there. Right, Christine? <laughs> Jesus Christ. I am so sorry, Thomas. We would love to have you back on the pod. <laughs> If you're willing to come back. <laughs> it's okay. Paul Paul is actually a rent a friend. Um yes, I, I a friend. He's not his friend. Yes. Yeah. He was rented actually. If you apparently if you pay twenty dollars, you can pick like oh. intelligence level and stuff like that. And he must have picked highly intelligent for this friend, um, this fake friend that he has. And I guess the different levels you would pay like more money. So if you like want a really intelligent friend, then you just like pay like 50 bucks instead of like 20 bucks. So uh -huh. yeah. So that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's the only explanation. I mean, I, I don't mean to laugh, but <laughs> 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 it sounds, it sounds like you're making all this shit up. Hey, it sounds but... like a great storyline. Right. It does. Like another black mirror, uh, thing like it would totally totally do well in like a good like sketch comedy like a like a weird buddy comedy it's like hey man like i just want to smoke buddy and uh, i hire like another stoner friend that comes yeah. with me. that is let's start a company <laughs> no <laughs> pass <laughs> but i think a movie like that would be great yeah, yeah. it'd be fun also a movie exactly yeah. movie. yes Yes, the movie sounds great. Yeah, where you, it is, it's very series oriented. It's could, it could be very much like a Black Mirror thing, like in the future, you know, where where that's what's going to happen. I know the premise. Oh my gosh, in the future, mm -hmm. very close to like what we are right now. Sure, it's a pandemic forever. Yeah, so it feels like nobody it. Nobody <laughs> make real friends anymore because they can't go out to socialize or they'll die. So they're all inside all the time so that to meet more people they have to pay a service to allow them to like create these like fake socializing scenarios mm -hmm. yeah i'm with you <laughs> no i'm with Everybody you is trolling me oh. says, <laughs> i'm such a genius yes yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> kelly hey, guys. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> who are you <laughs> why are you my friend are you my friend did i pay you <laughs> kelly no come clearly come to, keep coming clearly you need to be fired hey kelly if you could be our like roaster like our interest in the comments just like christine up whenever you can please and thank you <laughs> <laughs> um this podcast is just friends roasting me <laughs> Yeah. Dicks. <laughs> All right, I guess I deserve it. <laughs> no, I mean, like every other episode, it's also roasting me. It's like Adam was late. Adam forgot to stream. <laughs> no, but I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to talk about um, a little bit more about um, like uh, I, I watched a movie. Did you watch anything in the last few days that blew your mind? Um, just film prize stuff. Just film prize. Okay. I, I just watched a lot of film prize. I uh, have a confession to make. I 
rewatch my film many, many times over and over and over and over again. I do this when I'm nervous. Um, so I would say the last film I watched was Vue. <laughs> okay. Yes. Why do you do that? I don't know. I think it's a validation thing. I think I do it because I'm like, I think it's good. And then I, then I'll like go to sleep at night and I'll be like, no shit. It's terrible. Let me watch it again. And then I'll, then I'll go to sleep and be like, all right, this is fine. It's, it, it, it's not bad. And I'll wake up and be like, oh crap, it's terrible. No, it's Let me bad. Watch yeah. It Let's just make sure. Yeah. I do this all the time. Like film festivals. I've, I've definitely gone to a film festival where I hadn't seen the movie in a while. And right before the screening, I'll we love you too, Kelly. I'll literally watch the film again, like without mm-hmm. people, just to get give myself validation that I should show up. Like, I Which, I, won't I understand myself, that. You know, it's a weird weird fear, but um, I've totally done that. Uh, no, no, but it's a valid fear. I mean, uh, yeah, I would, I would too. I rewatched like season season one of Fun Employment podcast and. Uh, yeah, just to make sure, like, hey, like, I wasn't an idiot, was I? Well, I had a fat fucking belly, like, <laughs> during... Yeah, I did. I it looked like a belly. goddamn, like, morph donut. It looked like a... No, actually, it looked like a New York-style bagel. No, it did not look like a bagel. <laughs> no, no, no. It looked like a New York-style bagel. There's a difference. Not a regular bagel. A New York-style. It's <laughs> fat, doughy, and tan. <laughs> no, don't, don't. Just don't. No, yeah, I no, appreciate I, I it. it. We're all just self-deprecating and everything, but yeah. Um, yeah, no, but I understand where you're coming from, though, yeah. because it is it, it is quite it is quite alarming when you watch it the first time and you're just like, oh, oh, that could have been better. Oh, that could have been better, you know. And you start having that mental thing in your head, and that's yeah, so we're, gross. We're, we're our own worst critic, but man, it's like, so gross, though, Christine. Like, yeah. y- like it's it, because we're better than that. Like, we don't have to. Even though I, I will always do that, no matter what. And yeah, I will I'll probably forever no do it. Totally. But I don't, know, I don't know how we can fix that unless like, we have to fucking walk away and just pretend it doesn't exist anymore and move on. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Just, that could be unhealthy too. Who knows, you know? That's weird. It's just a weird thing. Walk or a hard place, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I just, I don't think that will ever go away, I wonder. And by the way, it's not like this. We're not trying to say like, oh, woe is me about being a filmmaker. It's really about like understanding the trials and tribulations of understanding your art, being critical of your art, and then also taking that criticism of your art with, with a grain of salt, right? Instead of, instead of just, uh, you know. Sorry, I'm going to ask. Uh, we got a good question. So, Paul. Sure. Said- so how do we get a kid with a dream to somebody who's basically is talking in a podcast and been nominated for awards? It's simple. We give him the entire chocolate factory. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of hard work. Charlie, you won the chocolate factory. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's the willingness. And I, I, it, this I credit to my parents for it. Um, they put me through piano, and they were very insistent about there's a point – in piano and any music instrument where you call music literacy, which means you can pick up any piece of music and be able to play it. And I definitely have that. Um, I'm perfectly musically literate. If someone gives me music, I will be able to play it. Maybe not perfectly the first time, but I can practice and get to the point that it's perfect. And that taught me the, what it means to sacrifice everything for something that you want to be good at. Yeah. And so that is what you credit it to is being willing to sacrifice everything for a dream. Um, uh, it doesn't matter what that dream is. It could be filmmaking, it could be being a chef, it could be, you know, whatever that may be, but that's, that is what that takes. That's the path is if you, and I can tell you, you know, if, people invite you to go hang out and do stuff and, and you rather sit by yourself in the dark editing your short film that's sacrifice but that's what it takes you know yeah so um that i can say i 
I may not be the best filmmaker. I may not be best at really anything, but like I can outwork the shit out of most people. <laughs> that's right. No, that's 100% without a doubt. And that for me was the key to where I am right now. Having just a dream and now, yeah, I'm a podcast talking to my bro and talking about films and uh, awards and stuff like that. It's just being able to outwork everybody because I truly, truly believe in what I do and I love, I love it. I love making films. There's nothing else I'd rather do. There's nothing better. It's home for, for us on a film set, um, which is, this is a perfect time for us to take it on a landing. We've done it for an hour, Christine. I know. Paul, you can't keep asking questions. <laughs> well, we can do... And it's, uh, well, hang on, hang on. Let's see what the... How, how did this guy how did get this here? How did this guy get here? Oh. What guy? How did, Me? Which guy? Adam? The, the, my co-host? What's his background? Oh, it is about you. Yeah, tell me. Tell oh. Me about background. Uh, I did talk about it a little bit in the first episode, sort of. Um, well, I, I talked about I, I, I was from California. I was originally from born in a little town called uh, <clears throat> Pleasanton, California, and which is like about 20 minutes east from uh, Castro Valley. And... Uh, Lived there for a whole bunch of years and then went to school, yada, 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 bada, bada, bing. And then finally uh, got an opportunity to move here to Austin and uh, be in uh, vocational film school because UT wouldn't accept me because I was way too fucking stupid. <laughs> um, and uh, no, I, in fact, I did apply. I, that's, this is a true story. I did apply oh. and I uh, got rejected literally that next week. Like they weren't wasting any fucking time. They were like, yeah, no thanks. You know, <laughs> really. so I was like, all right, man, that's fine. And then, uh, I, yeah, I, I got a, I got a sweet situation in Austin. And then I was like, you know what? I got to get to school somehow. And I stumbled on a little vocational school. And then I got partnered with, uh, Christine, who is a uh, mentor. Yeah. And she's been teaching me ever since. So everything I learned about filmmaking, get realisms, it's all it's all due to Moth to Flame Films, baby. I'm sorry. That's what's up. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sorry about what? Yeah. I'm sorry you ended up. What would? I'm sorry you ended up with me as your mentor. I wonder what would have happened. No. <laughs> no. If I got anyone different, it would have been a real fucked up. I'm so lucky, dude. I I told I told my mom this too, uh, not too long ago. I'm very, very lucky um, to be partnered with a, not even partner, just I, I like learned from from someone who is more passionate about film than I am, and that's that's saying a lot because I love movies so much, and I I growing up only. I own about 150 DVDs and each and every one of them, I watch all the behind the scenes like making of. So there's 150 movies that I saw all behind the scenes of, and I'm like, I want to fucking do that. Like whatever they're doing, I want to be part of that. That looks like magic. I want, I'm in. Whatever I have to do, I'm in. It's like a cult. It's fucking weird. But I'm like that film set experience like that. You can't, that's, that's a, uh, no one else will understand unless you love filmmaking. Yeah. And that's what kind of sucks because I wish the entire world can understand that feeling because it is a feeling of community and home because that first day when I, when Christine brought me into the film set, I, I was just a PA and I was a, a doofus at best. I was fucking everything up big time. Second day, I was late. Third day, I was late. <laughs> Fourth day. You know, I have to give you this like tiger mom. Um, like, yeah. Like, this thing where I like look at you and you go, yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, I, I, I fucked up. And I'm like. Yeah, yeah because, I because I have, I have bad habits. And, and I because smile and I say, but you learn from it. 
And you're like, yes, I did. I won't that's do it right. again. Like, great. That's all that matters. You, right, fixed, cool. you fixed those bad habits because <laughs> you're the only, but no, I'm serious. You're the only one who called me out on it because it's something that I'm truly passionate about. My other yeah. bosses sometimes don't give a shit. I've been late two hours to a job, Christine, and they just don't give a shit. But if I'm five minutes late on a film set, you give a shit and you notice you and you will say oh, something. Oh yeah, I come to you. I'm like, no oh. matter what. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I see you're late. So what happened? And it's just like, Oh, you know, you caught me, you know, it just, it, it, but it's keeping me in check and understanding what I truly love. And ever yeah. since then, I did my absolute best to be on time. And I have, yeah, except for maybe great. a couple of times, but yeah. I, I have, I have been 45 consistent seconds later. Yeah. yeah, 45 seconds later. No, but I've been consistent and I've been way better because if anybody knew me, especially I know a couple of people from my friends from California, I know I'm a late guy. That's just a California Bay Area thing. You're just late. You're late. It's okay. We're just late. We're fashionably late all the time. But it's a thing I, I have to fix. It's a it's a definite, definite problem. But um, yeah, I know it's, it's a crazy. long... It doesn't feel like I'm your mentor. Like most of the time, yeah. I just feel like I've known you for for a long time. I love. I always I love the story that you told me of what it, it was like when I first met you because my perspective was completely different. I was like, "Oh, yeah. I have a quick meeting, and then I'm gonna tell him some stuff, and I gotta go to my other meeting." <laughs> yeah, I know, and it was just a quick like it was two minutes, and I was fully prepared to sit with you for like an hour. <laughs> and and you were and you were like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, no, no worries." And then you were running late, and I was like, "Oh." Okay. And then I, I was hanging around and then finally you got there and you're like, Hey, so I only have two minutes, but uh, anyways, I have this film set that I have and it's a PA gig. It's going to be from this date to this day. Uh, do you want in? And that was it. And I was like, yeah. And I'm like, great. And then, well, I'll send you an email about it. Bye. All right, bye. I'll send you a call sheet. And I'm like, what's a call sheet? <laughs> you just took off. I'm like, Oh, okay. You know, All right, we're, we, we got one more question. Last yeah, one. So, sure. Uh, it says, I'm in a film group. Chelsea said, I'm in a film group. So how do you give or take with your art team when you have a vision in your head and the vision they have doesn't co coincide with what you see? That's a, that's a rough one. Um, yeah. You know what? I, how I, it's a little bit different when it comes to art because like you can't just undo something easily. Uh, with, with directing, I, ha I run into this a lot uh, with acting, with actors. And usually I can get away with it being like, hey, um, let's try one for me, like how I want you to do it. And then let's try it the way you want to do it, you know? That's so that smart. It feels like both of That's us. That's smart. So, but I get with art, it's a little bit different because like you can't just build a set and be like, well, let's just tear the whole thing down and try it. <laughs> hey, do it again. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it just depends without sometimes sometimes you just have to know where your battle is right so if, if, right. if it's going to compromise your vision and your film and stuff like that you might have to make the tough decision and yeah it, unfortunately i was about to say you have to like yeah. that ability to compromise is such a rare ability to have yeah. because nobody everybody has an ego bigger than their house and they don't want to, they don't want to budge for nothing. Right. So for them to compromise on a specific scene or take or whatever it is, because an actor couldn't nail it or it's schedule, whatever it is, it's, if you can't compromise from that, then, right. you know, and, and that's, I that doesn't work. The way you can go about it is sometimes you want to ask why, right? I think yeah. you can understand why somebody is so beholden to that vision you may be surprised that their why is not what you thought the why was um right which can alter how it could be a little about, personal <laughs> right and you, it can alter the way you approach or convince them otherwise so like uh -huh. uh, an example could be like you know this person has to have it to be blue right and you uh -huh. don't want and you're just like, well, I, I, do, I don't believe in that at all. So I would approach and be like, well, why do you think that it has to be this color? And then maybe you'll find that it has nothing to do with the story. Maybe it's something very personal. 
And then you got to like kind of figure out like, okay, so if it's that personal to them, am I okay with that? Or is it, is it something that I just cannot absolutely, um, absolutely like compromise with, and I'm just going to have to like part ways, you know, right. You always come to that. You always have, you always have the option to walk away. Just remember that. Yeah. What's in a respectful reason, in a but respectful way, there's always a way to, to walk away. And so I just think that if you can approach it that way, you approach, you know, all right, well, let's try it this way. Or like, Hey, I want to understand why you feel this and let me explain why I would like it this way. And let's see if we can come to a compromise. If we really just cannot, it just maybe just comes to the point where you guys are just not a good fit to work with each other. Unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and God forbid it gets to that point, but right. yeah, sometimes, like that. you know, I've yeah. talked to DPs where they're very specific. They want to get this one shot and, or they don't mm. like the shot that I want. And I will tell them flat out, like, all right, like, cool, let's, let's, let's try one for you, but I want it this way. Mm -hmm. And I've done that. I've done that on set where um, the, the camera op is very insistent that it needs to look a certain way. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, trust me. That's yeah. something else you have to, I've blatantly told people. Uh, if you're the director or whatever, I'm the director. Please trust me as your director. You know, that's, I've had to definitely say that to to other people and usually when you get to that point people are will will back off because they'll realize maybe like it's not worth getting there or there it's not there in the end no, no idea or vision is enough to compromise that of the directors because the direct it is ultimately the director's vision you know so um and they can always walk you know so i guess hopefully that's that was helpful um, but yeah, yeah so to, to summarize, one would be, let me try one for me. Let me try one for you. Mm -hmm. both have, uh, you know, do that. If that's not an option, asking why, uh, why do you have to feel this way? Here's why I feel this way. Can we come to a agreement or is this something that I want to choose my battle with and it's fine. Like, we'll just go with it even though I don't believe in it. It's whatever. Or you get to the point where you're like, all right, dude, like we just really clash on all levels and we should not be working together, you know? And that is very, very common. And there's nothing wrong to feel that way, you know? I've definitely come off sets AD and I just know that like, hey, I'm okay if that director never asked me to AD for them again because we're different. And certain things are very personal experiences, you know? Like, there are amazing ADs that I would never have as my AD, but not because they're a bad AD, it's just like, we're different and we just don't vibe the same way. So, like, sometimes you just have to walk away. And that's okay. And that's totally fine. Sometimes you just gotta walk away. Yeah, so that's the, that's the ending. Sometimes you just gotta walk away. And- Walk away. And scene. <laughs> so we end the, but how how bomb would that have been? Sometimes you have to walk away and we just stop the podcast. Yeah, we just we just we cut it right there. We just totally we bombed that. Adam, you just <sighs> It's my you podcast know? too. I don't want to cut it. How do you? <laughs> All right. Um uh, we're so rude. Well, I guess you ended Instagram Live. Rude. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess I guess Facebook. My co-host is is ready to get the fuck out. So, <laughs> I guess I guess I gotta say thank you so much. Thank you for the questions. The questions were awesome. Amazing yeah, questions, you guys. Great questions. Thanks, guys. Fantastic. Really, really cool. There were some really great questions. We love it when there's interaction because it makes these a lot more interesting than just us talking about. Ourselves.